Our very first morning aboard Good Life near Georgetown, Maryland. It's a beautiful morning here at the Sassafras River Marina, and we have a pile of work to do. Dave's sailing experience is relegated to several years of teaching sailing in albacores and petrels and racing albacores in his teams. He's sailed with friends on occasion since then, but nothing in the way of a liveaboard craft. I have all but zero experience. When our neighbor Tom from episode 4 told us about a friend of his, Mark, looking for a crew to take his Lagoon 420 from Georgetown, Maryland to Georgetown, Bahamas, we jumped at the chance. I had to hold down the business front, but Dave was a natural choice to send along. We knew he needed the experience, and I wanted to make sure at least one of us had the chops to make liveboard life work. The Lagoon 420 catamaran is precisely in the size range Dave and I are looking at, so this was the perfect opportunity. Dave and I are partners on every level, even at work. Our marketing company is home-based, so we are pretty much glued to each other. It makes people sick. We are so close. Seven weeks apart was going to be a real challenge, but we both believed it was necessary. Armed with new cameras, a remote mic, foul weather gear, and the painful learning curve of our previous video excursions, I jumped on a plane in Toronto, Canada, and headed for Maryland with Mark and his buddy Bernard. We met Brian, who had flown in from the UK in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and drove to the Sassafras River Marina near Georgetown, Maryland. Prepping a boat for extended sailing with four guys on board is a lot of work but waiting for the right weather window gave us some time. All of the engines, sail drives, generator and outboard fluids and filters had to be checked. Bernard jumped on that while I got in the way as much as possible with the camera. Dipstick other than the one holding the camera. The Lagoon 420 has panels over top of the engines allowing for more storage, so that's where the fluids and some of the other items are kept. It makes getting at the engines a bit of a chore, but it's very efficient. There is massive storage under the cockpit seating, especially alongside the generator. It's amazing how deep these lockers are and how much room there is. And here you can see Bernard removing the sound deadening panels from over top of the starboard engine. The panels are quite sturdy and the insulation underneath does a very good job of damping the engine sound. With those out of the way, Bernard will have plenty of room to get down inside there and check the fluid levels of the engine and the sail drive and check the fuel and water filters as well.
There are lots of little things that need to be repaired as you go. There's no shortage of boat projects. Ryan was working on fixing the door latch under the helm. We hoisted the main to inspect it and check the halyard sheets and lazy jack lines. Stink bugs decided that the sail bag was a perfect home for the summer. We ended up dealing with these things the entire trip. If we get 50 knots, they won't last very really. long. No, that's for sure. <laughs> The motors I love are. Fluffy love, darling. <laughs> it's called a dead cat. <laughs> In the UK, we call that woolly woman. <laughs> Goes to show what we're like in North America. It's a dead cat here. <laughs> Brian's great sense of humor helped a lot. Bernard was hard to keep up with. He seemed to be everywhere at once. I helped out where I could, but my greenness was showing. I want to put outside of the zipper bag. Okay. Outside of the zipper, because the zipper is going to get supported on me to prevent slipping forward. But if it keeps uh, doing like this, shaping on your line, we needed to re-rig the end of the sail bag. The bag had moved forward and was fouling the topping left and reefing lines. Then the sail bag had to be resecured to the boom. I'll take that spool out of your hand if you want. After that, we tested to make sure the running rigging was all freed up. Cars had been replaced on the mast, and the reefing lines weren't reinstalled in the best configuration, so there was quite a bit of sorting out to do. With the panels rolled down, I couldn't hear anything that was going on up on the deck, so Brian was doing the translating for me, giving me direction through the plastic so I could run the halyard up and down, and run the reefing lines. There. We gotta watch the wind doesn't blow us into that boat. What's that? Start 
untying this one and using the main. Yes, easy main. Drop it down slowly. It's okay, tight. Just gonna take a turn. Put the main board down. Or look at with me. One more. Where is that winch? Okay, can you hold this one for a second? Yep. It's about tight. Yeah, I'm coming to check something. The first reefing point is tied inside the sail bag at the base of the mast. It took a bit to get all the lines untangled. It was quite a mess to straighten out. But with Bernard and Mark working on it, and Brian and I diligently standing by in case we were needed, they eventually got it all straightened out and we were ready to start provisioning. Provisioning required a few trips using the marina's courtesy van. We didn't want to have to reprovision until we reached South Florida. Bernard's heading over with the first load of provisions. We were almost ready to set sail down the Chesapeake. 